This is the Lotmax Shark V2 3D printer and this is my review. So whenever I'm looking to get a new 3D printer in general, the first thing I always look for is something that just works. As someone who's always working on a project that requires rapid design changes and production of new prototype parts, reliability is really important to me. For me personally, I take reliability over print quality any day, but of course, everyone's different. At the Shark V2's $500 price point, you get a lot of features that you just wouldn't see on other printers. The V2's predecessor, the Shark V1, originally started as an Indiegogo campaign, but it received enough backing that it's now become a fully manufacturable product that you can buy. The Shark V2 comes straight out of the box with bicolor 3D printing, auto bed leveling, a removable 3.5 inch touchscreen display and also a separate laser engraving module. I'd say it's pretty rare that a single machine can boast so much functionality and actually live up to those expectations. Throughout this video I'll cover the unboxing, the assembly and I'm also going to put this printer through a lot of the different scenarios I might find myself in during one of my R&D projects. So let's dive into it and see what this printer is all about. Thanks to the great packaging, the printer arrived safe and sound, and inside you'll find a whole bunch of things that Lotmax have generously bundled in with this printer. The first thing you'll see is this user manual, and I have to say this is an excellent manual written in good English that was very easy to follow. It covers everything you'd need to know from assembly to bed leveling, right through to 3D printing and laser engraving setup. You'll also find two separate 200 gram spools of PLA filament, along with the laser engraving and bicolor 3D printing kits. There's also an excellent toolkit provided that contains everything you need to get this printer up and running. In the bottom right, you'll find the removable 3.5 inch touchscreen display, and then the entire top foam piece can simply be removed. Underneath, you'll find two thin sheets of wood for laser engraving, along with a gantry section of the 3D printer. Attached to the heat bed is, of course, the removable steel sheet. And remember to be extra careful when removing the gantry from the box, because there are cables attached. I recommend lifting the gantry up and then removing the foam from underneath. You should then be able to lift the entire printer out of the box. We can now assemble the printer, and honestly, this is the easiest printer assembly I've ever done. The bottom of the gantry has two holes which line up with the corresponding holes on the base of the printer. To install the gantry, I recommend slightly overhanging the printer on the edge of a table, carefully ensuring that the gantry doesn't fall over. This provides easy access to the holes underneath so that you can insert the bolts that secure the gantry to the base. After securing the gantry on both sides, your printer should now be standing tall, and we can move on to the rest of the assembly. So obviously with this printer being capable of bicolor 3D printing, the hot end has two separate filament inputs. Extruder 1 comes pre-installed as part of the Z-axis and Extruder 2 is included inside the bicolor 3D printing kit. The extruder even comes with the T-nuts already attached, making it even easier to install. The extruder simply mounts to the top of the frame and you tighten the two bolts. While installing the extruder, we might as well go ahead and install the two spool holders as well. These mount in the exact same way as the extruder, using two bolts. Next up, we can install the Bowden tubes, and just make sure that the tube for the second extruder runs behind the gantry. The pneumatic connectors are just push fit, again making it really easy to install. Finally, we need to install our connectors. The only things I needed to connect were the second extruder, the Z-axis motor, and the Z-axis homing sensor. The cables that run from the second extruder can be routed behind and underneath the printer so that they can be plugged in at the front. The very last thing we need to do is install the touchscreen display. This is done easily using this bracket that just bolts to the frame. When done, you can plug in the display and place it on the mount. And don't miss out on that satisfaction of peeling off that screen protector. After completing the assembly, your printer should look like this. I really love the design of this printer. I think it looks very clean and it doesn't take up a whole lot of space. The print volume in millimeters is 235 by 235 by 265. The heat bed itself is 250 by 250 
and that includes a removable steel sheet. Despite being quite tall, the printer itself has quite a small form factor. The power supply is built into the base of the all metal frame, which just gives it that little bit more stability. And the hot end has a three fan design, which Lotmax claim enable print speeds of up to 150 millimeters per second. To put that into perspective, your typical print speed is around 50 to 60 millimeters per second. So let's put it to the test and find out just how good this printer really is. So now let's turn the printer on for the first time. First, ensure that the correct voltage is set on the power supply. Yours could be different to mine depending on where you live. When you're happy, plug the printer in and hit that power switch. The printer should boot up and you'll be greeted by the main menu. First of all, let's talk about this awesome touchscreen display. The fact that you can pick this thing up and use it like a smartphone is a really big deal. It's one of those features where you don't fully realize its significance until you try it out. I think this will be especially useful for beginners because it just feels intuitive. The display itself is sensitive, responsive and delivers a completely fresh experience to what I'm currently used to with 3D printing. Now I find myself really struggling when going back to these old scroll wheels. Now that the printer is powered up, the first thing you'll want to do is level the bed. The printer does have auto leveling, but you should still run the manual leveling first. You can do this by pressing control and hitting the auto leveling button. The button on the top right is for manual leveling and when pressed, the touchscreen will update and you should be able to select each of the different bed positions. As with any other 3D printer, you can use a single sheet of paper as a gauge and you'll want to bring the bed height up just until you feel a little bit of drag on the paper. When you've completed the manual leveling, you can now run the auto leveling process and the printer will go through its leveling procedure. The printer will end this procedure at the center of the bed where you can fine tune the Z height using the touchscreen display. With everything now set up and ready to go, we can load some filament and start our first print. It's worth noting that both extruders have filament sensors and both need to be loaded with filament in order to print, even for single extrusion. For the very first print, it made sense to test the filament provided and print a few things that were preloaded to the SD card. The first object I printed was this crocodile in orange PLA. The steel sheet has very good adhesion and prints can be easily removed by bending the sheet. As you can see, for a first print, the results here are very impressive. The second print was also preloaded to the SD card, but this time I thought I'd use some of my Polyterra PLA provided by Polymaker. What I love about this filament is that it gives you a really great looking matte finish. The filament is also produced sustainably, and for each spool you buy, Polymaker plants a tree. If you're interested, I'll leave links in the video description down below, and if you do decide to buy any, be sure to use my discount code, the hardware guy, to save 10% at checkout. One other thing I wanted to emphasize here is just how quiet the printer is. The fans are always gonna be fans, and there are three of them, but the printer itself is extremely quiet and it doesn't make any horrible mechanical sounds. Shinier filaments tend to hide imperfections on 3D prints, which is why they're so commonly used. While a filament like Polyterra PLA does leave a nicer finish, in my opinion, the downside is that it can bring out imperfections a lot more, if there are any there. For this reason, I was really keen to see how this printer performed using a more challenging filament. Once again, the results are very impressive. Layer lines are visible, but as I said earlier, with a matte finish, this is almost impossible to avoid. That being said, I do love that matte finish, and I really think it it makes prints stand out. Next, I decided to have a go at bicolor 3D printing. Honestly, I didn't know what to expect going into this. I've used multi-material printers in the past, and more often than not, it's a real pain. Once again, this was a preloaded model, and I decided to use my gray and purple Polyterra PLA. For those that don't know how this works, the printer changes filament by itself during the print. This allows you to print in more than one color. The circular object near the print is called a wipe tower. The printer uses this to bleed out the previous color after changing filament. As you can see, it seems to be doing this extremely well and there's no color bleed on the print whatsoever. This is the final result and once again, I'm really impressed how well this worked. This was my first attempt with no failed prints and the contrast between the two different colors is excellent with no visible color bleed. Bicolor printing does obviously increase print time and it looks like this was sliced and printed at 0.3 millimeter layer height. But regardless of the layer height, the finish on the print itself is very good. 
After achieving some great results with the preloaded models, I thought I'd check out the LockMax software and try slicing some of my own. All the software that you'll need will be on the micro SD card that came with the printer. The slicing software is basically Cura, but optimized for this particular printer. This was my first time using Cura and I picked it up really easily. Also worth noting, all the print settings I use in this video are standard, aside from the print speed in certain tests. So you may be able to achieve even better results if you put the time into tweaking the settings. I printed off this bench sheet in a few different colours. Layer height was 0.12mm and once again really not bad for a first attempt and at stock settings. Another model I tried was this Easter Island statue. I printed this hollow at 0.12mm and at a print speed of 60mm per second. And once again I think the results here speak for themselves. Seriously good. This isn't too far off what I could get from my Prusa Mark III. While small prints are typically the most common, a lot of printer reviews tend to skip over large prints. I took the Easter Island model from before and I scaled it up 400%. I wanted to make sure I put this to the test here because a lot of printers actually struggle with longer prints. The model is pretty low poly so the curves are not the smoothest. This is no fault of the printer, it's just what happens when you scale up small models. The main point being here that the print completed successfully and for me this is a big thumbs up. This was printed in the grey Polyterra PLA and the Shark V2 is definitely delivering on that print quality. I actually ended up painting this with some acrylic paint and it's now outside in the garden. Great example of a practical print. Gears with small fine teeth are among some of the most challenging objects to print. These are gears I designed for my recent Raptor 2 project, so I threw them at this printer to see how it fared against them. The results on this one are exceptional. This is just as good as anything I'd get off one of my more expensive machines. Another popular print I tried was Baby Groot. This one was pretty funny because on the first attempt I accidentally exported with a wrong printer profile. The result though actually looked pretty cool. The print finished but obviously suffered with some serious under extrusion. Again, this is no fault of the printer, this was just my mistake. So naturally I re-sliced the model, ran the print again and this was the final result. Another fantastic print and honestly at this point this machine is pretty much taking anything I throw at it. One thing this printer really boasts about is its print speed, so I thought I'd put this to the test. I reprinted the bench sheet and Easter Island statue at 150mm per second. This is over twice the speed of the previous prints, which I printed at 60mm per second. Comparing the two prints, on the left the Benchy printed at 60mm per second and on the right the Benchy printed at 150mm per second. There honestly isn't a lot of difference between the two prints and with some tweaking in the slicer the faster print quality could still be improved. This is really impressive because if you're someone like me who mostly prints mechanical parts for projects, these small visual defects won't really matter and this reduction in print time can massively increase your efficiency. The final test I had for this printer was to try and print in my favourite material which is PETG. I just find PETG so easy to work with and the print quality is always great. This part that I've printed is for my Raptor 2 project and was printed with Polymaker Polylite PETG at 0.3mm layer height. The print was successful and looks incredible but this did cause an issue on the printer. This particular steel sheet has very strong bed adhesion. Often as a cost cutting measure some manufacturers will take a magnetic sheet and secure a textured surface to it using an adhesive. While this is beneficial for PLA printing, when you start using stronger materials that print much hotter, it can be really difficult to remove them from the steel sheet. When removing this PETG print, I actually damaged the steel sheet. This is definitely not a deal breaker, but my advice would be to buy a third party steel sheet if you wish to print with more exotic filaments. Fortunately, I already had this steel sheet lying around, so I did continue and test another PETG print. If you're interested in this steel sheet, I'll leave a link in the description below. The PETG print I tested were these print in place pliers. I figured this would be a great demonstration of tolerance since this print is functional when you remove it from the bed. With the new steel sheet the PETG print is very easy to remove. The print is functional which again demonstrates the capabilities of this printer. The last thing we'll take a look at is the laser engraving module. Inside the laser engraving kit you'll find the laser module and a separate device that attaches to the front of the printer. A quick bit of advice, lasers are dangerous. They can cause burns, fires and even damage your eyesight. It's important that you wear the provided safety goggles whenever you're around the laser. It's also very important that you have appropriate ventilation for laser engraving because it releases harmful fumes. The laser module is very easy to install. 
First you remove the extruder head by removing the two bolts and you can conveniently secure it safely to the top of the printer frame. To install the laser you simply attach it and reinsert the two bolts. Really easy. You then need to plug the laser module into the printer. The module has a T-nut which must be secured to the bottom of the printer. This stops the module from falling out. For this test I'll be using one of the wooden sheets provided. The sheet must be secured to the heat bed using some clips. While the SD card does come with engraving files, I thought I'd jump straight in and try to engrave my own custom image. I grabbed this awesome image of Crash Bandicoot from the internet and imported it to the Lotmax engraving software. You can access this software through Cura by clicking the laser option in the toolbar. My first impressions of this software are not great. It seems very buggy and definitely needs a lot of improvement. For some reason when I tried to import a PNG image it just gave me this black box. I converted the image to JPEG and that seemed to solve the problem. I also couldn't set my canvas width to be greater than 175 which seems odd given that the sheets are 250mm by 250mm. I decided to keep things simple so I just imported my image, resized it and generated the engraving files. When you turn the printer back on, it'll boot up and automatically detect that the laser is installed. Before engraving, you first need to set the height of the laser. The user manual covers this well, but basically you need to set up the focal point. This will determine how sharp your engraving looks. If your engraving looks a little blurry, it probably needs to be a little bit closer. After setting a focal point that you're happy with, you can save it to the machine for future use. After completing the setup, I started my first ever laser engraving. To make it look a little better, I created this time lapse for you. So there it is, my first ever laser engraving. I honestly had no idea what to expect, but I was so pleased with how it turned out. The engraving is really sharp and I'll definitely be playing around with this a lot more in the future. So what are my final thoughts? Well, I have to say that overall, I'm very impressed with this printer. What I love about it the most is that despite having so much functionality, it remains plug and play. It's the easiest printer assembly I've ever done. The Bicolor 3D printing is effortless. The laser engraving module can be installed within 30 seconds and there's no messing around in between having to reflash different firmwares. It's just one firmware image and the printer knows what you're looking to use just based on what's plugged into it. The other thing that kind of blew me away about this printer was that removable 3.5 inch touchscreen display. Being able to just grab that screen and pick it up and use it like a phone is a game changer. After using that display now for over a month, it's been really hard to go back to my older printers that have that little scroll wheel. If you're a person like me who often has multiple projects on the go and you need 3D printed parts fast, the Shark V2 will be an asset to your workshop. As I mentioned at the start of the video, reliability is really important to me. I like being able to just pop in the SD card, press print, and walk away with that confidence that in a few hours or a few days, that print is gonna complete successfully. After using the Shark V2 for a month now, I've definitely got that confidence in the machine, and I'm now using it as one of my primary printers alongside my Prusa Mark III. The only thing I was disappointed with was the steel sheet, but again, this isn't a deal breaker. The printer itself is fantastic, and if you are looking to print with materials other than PLA, you can easily pick up some third-party steel sheets at very reasonable prices. And the best part of all is that for $500 or £360 here in the UK, not only do you get a fantastic bicolor 3D printer, but you also get a very capable laser engraver. Just like the bicolor 3D printing, the instructions were so easy to follow, and it just did it effortlessly. The only critique I have about the laser engraving process is that software. It definitely needs a lot of improvement. It seemed really buggy when I was using it, and it could really just do with a general UI overhaul and some serious user testing. That being said, it did work. I was able to engrave my own custom image onto a piece of wood. And of course, there are plenty of other software packages out there for laser engraving. 
To conclude this review, I'd like to say that I think it's awesome that smaller, newer companies are starting to manufacture these high quality, multifunctional printers at very competitive prices. I think the initial hype of the whole 3D printing movement, we've kind of exited that now, and people are starting to ask, you know, how can we make these machines that are already great even better and deliver more value to people? I think the Shark V2 will definitely be in the running for one of the best value for money printers of 2021. Let me know what you think in the comments below. As always, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the review, and I'll see you in the next video.